good afternoon good evening uh, orinoco tribune has turned 4 years old i mean this month so it was founded in november 2018 in caracas venezuela by jesus rodriguez espinosa who is here as a voice of chavistas to the world to disseminate real information from inside venezuela uh, with a chavista perspective and in english also in order to break the language barrier between chavismo and the world and to reach the people, especially of those countries whose governments are inflicting the blockade against Venezuela. A news outlet like this is essential because economic blockade does not exist alone. There is also a media blockade against Venezuela, against Chavismo, against the Bolivarian Revolution, against the Venezuelan people. And this blockade uh, amplifies a small but very well funded, US funded, and US backed extreme right in Venezuela and suppresses the thoughts and opinions and real news of everyday Venezuelans. So Orinoco Tribune uh, was founded with the aim of giving a voice to those people who are invisibilized in mainstream media and well, who are basically erased from mainstream media. So just putting these people in the forefront is what Orinoco Tribune aspires to. In addition, uh, our vision is not confined to Venezuela only. You know, we also have a Latin American and global dimension because we believe that Bolivarianism is not confined to Venezuela, but it is everywhere in the global south as well as in the whole world because we believe in Chavez's vision and uh, spirit of internationalism. So today we are going to talk about just that, about our basic principle, our spirit. Uh, we call ourselves Chavistas. Uh, it is what the Orinoco Tribune webpage says uh, at the top. So what is Chavismo? What is its history? And what is it doing? Where is it going? And what has it got to do with us? So these things will be discussed today by the editor of Orinoco Tribune, Jesus. And please ask your questions in YouTube. We are uh, live streaming in YouTube. You can ask in the chat. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible. We'll have a sort of discussion after Jesus has uh, finished his presentation. However, before going into today's topic, I must remind you all that we are an independent media outlet, which means that we do not receive financial support from any corporation nor from any government, irrespective of what Wikipedia may claim. We depend entirely on donations from you, from our readers or followers. And we would not have been able to function uh, without you. So thanks a lot for your support for the last four years. And please continue to support us. Continue to support financially with donations because that is what on which we depend, as well as by reading and sharing our articles and spreading the word. At present, our annual fundraising is going on. So please consider donating whatever little you can. We have a goal of reaching uh, $200 monthly donations. So help us reach that modest aim at a time like this when everything is so expensive. And now I will hand this over to Jesus, who is an expert in international relations, Venezuelan politics and uh, communication. And he served for many years as the Consul General of Venezuela in Chicago in the United States. So today, let's see with what knowledge and as a diplomat and media expert, he comes to us. Okay, Jesus, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sahili, for the presentation and for being there. Um, and thank you, all of you, uh, Compass, uh, our followers uh, of Arinoco Tribune. Uh, and that right now uh, we are celebrating our fourth anniversary and you say the uh, fast but it's it means a lot of work it means a lot of uh, effort from many people uh, all our team that right now is getting bigger and stronger but uh, i believe it's important to recognize the work that they has been doing and also to recognize the the, the work that that you are doing uh the readers I'm talking about, the followers in in supporting us, in reading us, and letting us letting us know about the mistake that we might might have committed. So right now, what I'm gonna do is to share my screen in order for you to see a slideshow that I prepared for today. Um, 
basically uh, with uh, with the things that I want to talk about. So I hope that you can see the slideshow there. It's loading. Uh, and I'm going to begin. Uh, the, the whole idea of this presentation is to talk a little bit about Chavismo. But before doing that, I mean, for doing that, we need to go a little bit back in time, even to pre-independence Venezuela and the independent process in Venezuela, because uh, Chavismo has a lot of things to do with that process, especially when we talk about Simon Bolivar. So um, uh, let me start from that particular moment. And I have, I, I wanna try to do it as brief as I can. And it's a lot of information that, that I'm gonna skip. So that's why I want uh, all uh, our editorial team, uh, Franz, uh, Uni, Sara, Sahili, and anyone from the team that join us later to interrupt me. I don't want this to be like a, like a, lecture or something if you find something that i'm saying that is not uh, that you don't understand or that you believe is a mistake or something like that feel free to interrupt me because my slogan is i'm not perfect i'm i'm far i'm far from perfect so we are human beings and we commit mistakes so but i have to begin talking about the spanish colonization uh, uh, and all the bad things that it brought to to our region i'm talking about caste-based society i'm talking about slavery i'm talking about religion and you know force uh, uh, in religious indoctrination i'm talking about classism racism supremacy all those things came here from europe and uh, and of course that ignite a response from our people uh, here, and 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 that take us, you know, to to mention all the cimarronary revolts that happen in Venezuela, but all over Latin America, the indigenous resistance that was also very significant, and all those events somehow uh, triggered uh, the independent process from within Latin America. But of course, there were also, uh, you know, triggers for the independent process that, that came from abroad, from Europe, uh, mainly. So one of those things was the foreign trade uh, monopoly, which was in the hands, of course, uh, of the Spanish crown. So in the case of Venezuela, Casa Guipuzcoana uh, was the, the, like the company like, like like the British have the, it's British Indian uh, company or whatever name they had. We had in Venezuela Casa Guipuzcoana, and and the Spanish uh, had the monopoly of the trade over Latin America or over its colonies, and that of course created. Uh, you will see during the my slideshow. Let me stop a little bit there. This imperialism alerts arrows and and smearing campaigns or misinformation alerts uh, arrows all over the presentation because uh, uh, I wanted to highlight those things because I mean basically what happened with that monopoly in, in foreign trade was that many countries in Europe uh, not uh, Spain of course uh, were wanted to have control of that trade with Latin America also and that was part of the uh, foreign push towards uh, the independence movement in our region. So the Reedies were very active in that. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, another foreign igniter for the you know independence movement in our region was the crisis in Europe with the fall of Ferdinand VII in Spain. Basically the occupation of, of Spain by the French uh, um, empire, I mean, uh, so that created uh, the perfect environment for the independence movement that were also inspired by the U.S. Uh, Revolutionary War, the independence in the U.S. Uh, and the independence in Haiti also, uh, and uh, and the whole Enlightenment process in Europe. Uh, so so that were, those were like the igniters for the independence movement in, in the region. In Venezuela, it began in 1810 with the Grito de Independencia or what we call uh, La Proclamación de Independencia on April 19, 1810. So, so uh, in, uh, that was like the first move 
towards independence in Venezuela. And in 1811, on the 5th of July in 1811, we finally signed our first constitution with the signing of Declaration of Independence of Venezuela one, more than one year later. And that, uh, that, that process, we call it First Republic. And it ended with the capitulation of Francisco de Miranda, who was the commander of the independence military. Uh, uh, to Monteverde, which was the commander of the Spanish military at that moment. And, and, and that ended up with Miranda being in jail and Simon Bolivar being sent uh, to exile in Colombia, to the jungle. Uh, and, uh, and it marks the end of the First Republic. From Colombia, Bolivar organized what we call the Campaña Admirable, the Admirable Campaign, which was basically a march, uh, like a campaign uh, that he launched from Colombia to Venezuela. And he finally uh, entered Caracas after defeating the, the Spanish army uh, in several places all over the uh, west of Venezuela uh, uh, in 1813. And at that moment, Bolivar was first called the Liberator. Uh, and that Second Republic also didn't last too much, was short-lived because many historians say that it was because uh, the independence process and the Bolivar analysis of the reality in Venezuela did not properly understood the necessity of connecting with the indigenous movement, with the Creoles, with the black movements, so that's why Boves show up during that Second Republic, and, and Boves was uh, a Venezuelan that was pro Spain, pro monarchy, and that was that, that launched a bloody war that ended up with Bolivar basically being expelled and the in the in the independence armies being uh, defeated. So Bolivar uh, spent like three years, most of the time of that time in the Caribbean. I'm talking between 1814 and 1817 in the Caribbean. And he uh, understood then uh, the necessity of interconnecting with the, with the, with the indigenous movement, with the black movement, uh, 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 to bring them together uh, uh, to the independence movement. And that's when the movement, when the Third Republic was launched and it was marked by the Congreso de Angostura. Uh, but to do that, to arrive back to Venezuela, Bolivar received a lot of help from Haiti that was the second, you know, uh, republic in the hemisphere after the US that, you know, gained independence from France. So uh, it's important to highlight those things. Uh, and, and since 1817 until 1821, when we uh, win the Battle of Carabobo, uh, uh, that marks like the final, you know, defeat of the Spanish in Venezuelan territory, uh, we call that uh, process until 1830, uh, the Third Republic. Uh, but I... Uh, but during that third republic from from 1821 until 1830 bolivar dedicated most of his efforts to uh achieve the independence in the rest of the continent i'm talking about nueva granada which is currently colombia i'm cor I'm, I'm talking about uh, ecuador i'm talking about peru i'm talking about alto peru which is currently uh bolivia but was then part of peru I'm talking about Panama, which was, which was part of Colombia uh, at that moment, uh, but was seized by, by, by the pressure of the United States because they wanted to have control over the, the canal, the Panama Canal. So, so Bolivar's idea was to have uh, this Latin American, including Caribbean uh, unity block uh, and, and for that, he launched the Congreso de Panama, the, the, the Congress of Panama initiative that was heavily sabotaged by the U.S. And he also launched the, the, the whole idea of Gran Colombia, which uh, is basically the nation that, that, that appears after, you know, Bolivar consolidated the, the, the liberation of, the, of those countries that I mentioned before. So, so... Bolivar managed to have his dream uh, partly achieved by this big country called Gran Colombia, but in 1830, uh, that dream 
uh, finish when uh, separatist movement within all those different provinces of Gran Colombia. I'm talking about Venezuela. I'm talking about Colombia. I'm, I'm talking about uh, Ecuador, uh, Peru, and Bolivia. Uh, began to uh, request their independence from the from the from the Gran Colombia, as we call it. So, so that marks a, a big defeat for Simon Bolivar, and I believe that many historians believe that that also was part of, uh, of the of Bolivar ending up being sick. Uh, of course, you have to add assassination attempts and betrays and things like that. But anyway, I'm going to jump right now to what happened in, in Venezuela uh, after Bolivar's death, which was basically a succession of uh, civil wars that began with Pais and Monagas that were kind of uh, uh, compadres uh, and that controlled Venezuela from 1830 until almost 1860. And from that moment on, uh, we have this succession of wars that we call the federal wars, where, where basically uh, the most important figures were Ezequiel Zamora, Antonio Guzman Blanco, which was uh, a modernizer, pro friends pro-European uh, uh, president that ruled Venezuela for several years and that has that indebted Venezuela a lot with Europe. And we have Cicriano Castro uh, that ended that process of, you know, uh, federal wars and, and civil wars in Venezuela that uh, ruled Venezuela from 1899 until, 18, until 1908. So it's important to highlight that during Cipriano Castro uh, rule, uh, uh, we suffered in Venezuela the first imperialist blockade. I mean, basically, uh, ships, military ships from, from um, Germany, Italy, and uh, which was the other country? Germany, Italy. I believe that uh, the Netherlands were there, but I'm missing one country. But anyway, they, they, basically what happened during that blockade is that Venezuelan coasts were blocked. I mean, physically blocked with uh, several, I believe that there were like six, between six and eight uh, military vessels from, from those countries. And uh, and they uh, didn't allow the entry of, uh, of ships. And they were basically claiming uh, uh, Venezuela to pay a crazy debt that Guzman Blanco uh, uh, agreed with uh, uh, a German uh, railroad uh, project that he, uh, Ambitioned when he was uh, ruling the country. Uh, uh, during those years of Cristiano Castro, the most important income of Venezuela was uh, um, coffee. And the price of coffee was going uh, crazy in the world markets, and Venezuela suffers a lot from that. And Cipriano Castro was also kind of a nationalistic uh, uh, leader that uh, that didn't want, decided not to pay. And it says that uh, that uh, debt was over, you know, built, and uh, and that uh, end up having us uh, suffering that blockade for three months. That ended up with an agreement signed in Washington in 1903, uh, where basically Venezuela agreed to pay one fraction, I believe, that one third of the of the debt claimed by the European powers, and uh, and we ended that process. But that's another imperialist alert because uh, you know you see how the European. Uh, or the foreign empires uh, interfering in the domestic, you know, um, political and 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 and, and the life in in Venezuela. Uh, of course, that uh, that imperialist process. I mean, that blockade doesn't have anything to do or uh, uh, in scale. I'm talking about with what happened in uh, what is happening right now in Venezuela. So I'm going to talk about that later anyway. But from from 190. Uh, Eight until 1935, for almost 30 years, Juan Vicente Gomez, which was a compadre of Cipriano Castro, uh, took control of the country. He did a coup d'etat. Basically, Cipriano Castro went to Europe to, for a surgical procedure, and, and Cipriano Castro took advantage of that situation, and he took control of the country. And during that moment, uh, oil was beginning to be discovered in Venezuela. 
and was, you know, uh, I mean, basically the, the, the industrial north realized the importance of oil. So that's the moment where oil concessions and oil companies began to exploit and get concessions in Venezuela. And that leads to what some people, historians, call the modernization of Venezuela. Uh, and of course, Juan Vicente Gomez was very docile with those U.S. corporations, mainly U.S. corporations that uh, began to exploit the, the oil in Venezuela and that changed our economic landscape. A lot of people blame Venezuela for uh, for for being too dependent of oil, but not too many people pay attention to how foreign uh, forces uh, intervene into our economic landscape in order to to get what they wanted from us which in our case was oil so that particular phenomena uh, altered the whole economic dynamic in Venezuela transforming Venezuela from an agricultural country to a um, you know mining uh, oil country uh, that we still are uh, up to date so it's important to highlight that. It is important to highlight the, the influence of those U.S. corporations in the staying of power of Juan Vicente Gómez for the, the, that, that long dictatorship, which is the longest dictatorship that Venezuela has suffered in his history. After Gómez there, uh, other compadres of him, uh, Eleazar López Contreras and Isaías Medina and Garita, uh, took control of the country. And they ruled basically for 10 more years, from 35 until 45. And they tried to open uh, uh, democratic processes in the country. Many historians agree with that. Uh, but uh, in 1945, the, the, the uh, basically uh, Acción Democrática, which is one of the most important parties of Venezuela, historically talking, uh, launched a coup d'etat uh against Medina and Garita and and they began what is called the Trienio Adeco which Trienio Adeco which is uh, basically uh those three years uh, where they uh many they were accused of being extremely sectarian against other political parties but they also uh uh moved the country into a more democratic according to many historians uh approach, more modern democracy, represented democracy approach, uh, U.S. style. So um, they ended up having elect uh, Romulo Gallegos as president of Venezuela in 1948. So uh, between 19, between February and November 1948, Romulo Gallegos was uh, president of Venezuela, but he began to put taxes to oil companies. He was, uh, according to some historians, uh, he had some nationalistic approaches, and uh, and they had a, they organized a coup de dance against him that ended up with him resigning in 1848. And that could have, that led to another bloody dictatorship in Venezuela, which is the Marcos Pérez Jiménez dictatorship that lasted with, from 80, from 48 until 58. And that was the, the last dictatorship in Venezuela. And it ended in uh, January 23rd, 1958, and led to what we call uh, uh, the Punto Fijo Pact, which is basically an alliance between Acción Democrática, which is a, has always been a party that is central, center left, uh, and, and COPE, which always has been a party center right, and URD, which was a, like a division of Acción Democrática that, that some people call it to be um, a little bit to the left of Acción Democrática. So, that this is what happened in Venezuela uh, uh, during those years, and now I'm going to jump to the to what we call the Fourth Republic, which is basically that moment between the ending of the of the coup d'état against um, 
against uh, Perez Jimenez and the arrival of Hugo Chavez to Miraflores. So during those years, uh, Venezuela passed through different stages. One of the most relevant politically talking is the one uh, connected to the guerrilla movement. Uh, Venezuela and many places in Latin America were influenced by the Cuban revolution. And there were several guerrilla movement that appears in Venezuela in the 60s, mostly, and the most important ones with the ones again, uh, organized by MIR, Movimiento de Izquierda Revolucionaria, the PSV, the Communist Party of Venezuela, with his military arm, which was the Fuerzas Armadas de Liberación Nacional, FALN, and also the Socialist League uh, have a lot of influence over those guerrilla movements that ended up uh, uh, being a squish uh, by uh, the military and the political police uh, of the time that was heavily infiltrated by the U.S. intelligence until the 90s and maybe the 2000s. So, so it's important to highlight that because uh, uh, not too many people know that it was a, a guerrilla movement in Venezuela and that it was easily defeated uh, by the end of the 60s. Some very tiny, small guerrilla movement lasted until the early 80s, but they were not really relevant. Uh, and between during the 60s, Venezuela lived what we call the, the Saudi Venezuela, Venezuela Saudita. And that was uh, the result of the uh, astronomical increase in oil prices because of the creation of the OPEC, because of the uh, Ormuz uh, Strait crisis uh, in 73, and a lot of revenue entered the country. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and we live like in a bubble of wealth for maybe one or two decades between the late 60s and the, and the, and the early uh, 80s. But in, 80, in 1982, uh, Venezuela suffered what is called the, the Black Friday, El Viernes Negro, where the Bolivar was devaluated heavily and that created uh, a terrible economic crisis in Venezuela that was fixed between quotations uh, with the arrival of the second government of Carlos Andrés Pérez, which was a uh, leader from Acción Democrática. And he implemented an illiberal package, IMF-style uh, uh, shock, uh, economic shock uh, packages. Uh, and, and, and he pushed privatizations, reduction of, of the of the payroll of the state, all the things that IMF uh, did before and is doing currently. And that didn't help us with anything and that creates a lot of social tensions within Venezuela. And that was the igniter of El Caracaso, which was basically an uprising that happened in several cities in Venezuela in 1989. And somehow that's how Hugo Chavez first comes to light, uh, or, or at least uh, first, I mean, see uh, uh, his political, uh, he saw at that moment his political call, because I mean, he said several times when he was president uh, of Venezuela, when he was alive, that uh, he was among those military officers that were asked to, were ordered to shoot at those demonstrators uh, in, uh, during the Caracaso, and, and, and he, among other military officers, realized that they were not going to do that. They were not going to shoot against the people. But of course, they were a minority. And during El Caracaso, there were, according to many experts, between 1,500 and 300 uh, deaths in Venezuela due to, milit to police military repression. So uh, since that moment, Hugo Chavez began organizing his uh, uh, rebellion uh, within the military, but also in, in other, you know, political, civil areas of Venezuela. And that led to the military rebellion in 1992, uh, el 4 de febrero, the, 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 the February, the February the 4th, 1992. So that rebellion was, I mean, was not successful, Hugo Chavez was, take, uh, was taken uh, uh, prisoner, 
and one mistake uh, from the side of the right wingers that they did was to put uh, Hugo Chavez in front of the cameras during those days, those hours, and during in that TV appearance of Hugo Chavez, he he basically uh, took responsibility for the coup for for the rebellion. And uh, he also said that the objectives were were not uh, achieved for now, por ahora. And that por ahora get very deep into the brain of Venezuelans because they meant for many like a, like a like a wish of change, like a, like the possibility of a future uh, success of Hugo Chavez. And uh, and that was a critical moment in Venezuelan history. Hugo Chavez is taken prisoner and he was sent to jail uh, for military rebellion. And and uh, and that happened in 1992. And I believe that in 1995 uh, he was pardoned by Rafael Cardera, what, what, that was the president elected. <coughs> sorry, in 1990. 93, I believe. Uh, and Rafael Carrera from Copey, uh, which is center right, uh, uh, was elected uh, raising the flags of uh, the, the political restoration of the country and uh, criticizing the neoliberal package of Carlos Andres Perez and everything that, that Hugo Chavez was saying that was running the country. Uh, but he did the opposite. I mean, he continued, I'm talking about Rafael Cardera, he continued with the neoliberal practices. Venezuela was privatized. Uh, uh, everything was, uh, a lot of people were um, released from work. I mean, were fired. Uh, and, uh, and we live in Venezuela from 89 to 99, neoliberalism, uh, salvaje, as we call it. Uh, and, and 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 it's important to highlight that because a lot of people believe that we jump from being Venezuela Saudi uh, uh, to Hugo Chavez uh, government, which is not true. We leave uh, the the terrible mistakes and the terrible uh, craziness of um, IMF neoliberalism and uh, therapy shocks. Uh, for, for example, we had Iberia, which was our national airline, and it was sold to uh, sold to to Iberia, the Spanish airline. Uh, Spanish did not last. I mean, it, it did not had control of of Viasa uh, for more than a year when they decided to begin selling the planes by parts, and just because of that, Venezuela ended up with no airline that's why we, our current uh, venezuelan airline uh, which is conviasa have that name it was some sort of remembrance of of viasa which was uh, that airline that was destroyed by ne the neoliberalism i i may i put the the flag there about misinformation alert because during the presidential campaign of hugo chavez when he went out of jail he uh, uh, many were not sure what to do. Many say that he didn't have to run for president. And many say that he had to uh, go to, you know, to to subvert actions, to guerrilla fight and that kind of thing. But he decided otherwise. He decided to run for president and he won the elections in 1998 and he took office in 1999. And... Uh, but there was a humongous misinformation campaign, very similar to the misinformation campaigns you see during Lula's elections recently, during Petro's elections recently, during any elections where you know uh, progressive forces uh, are uh, about to take control of a country, uh, and they keep repeating that misinformation that that the, the, that that president or candidate is going to uh, take your house that is going to uh, repress the people and and all the lies that comes with anti-communism and that is very rooted in our region because of all the campaign launch by the united states at least in our region in the 50s and 60s so that brought us to the moment of chavismo properly i'm talking about 
uh, the period between 1999 and 2002. Right now, we have the constituent process. Uh, please, guys, if you don't understand something, feel free to jump. Uh, or if I say something wrong. Uh, and, uh, and from 1999 until 2002, the first things that President Chavez did was approve the new constitution, the new constitution, the, the, la constitución de la República Bolivariana de Venezuela, the constitution of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela was shaped and approved in a referendum, which was the most important promise that Hugo Chavez launched during his presidential campaign. And he did it in less than, 18 months, which is miracle, mi miraculous because we, he was fighting with all the status quo that didn't want any change like in many countries happen. So uh, he managed to do that. Uh, we achieved our new constitution. Uh, and, uh, and from that moment, uh, I mean, a, a new scope uh, of things, uh, happen in the country. I mean, I'm talking about, for example, the Cuba-Venezuela agreement, a comprehensive agreement that was signed in 2000 and, and, and that we celebrated a few uh, days ago, the, the, the 22 anniversary of that agreement, which is based, that basically allowed Mission Robinson to be launched in Venezuela. Mission Robinson was that uh, campaign to eradicate illiteracy in Venezuela. Uh, with the help of the Cubans, we launched a mission uh, Barrio Adentro, which is that very important uh, social program launched by Hugo Chavez with the help of medical doctors mainly, uh, and was framed with the, that, that Venezuela, Cuba Venezuela agreement uh, signed in 2000. And many other social programs that the Venezuelan government uh, launched uh, uh, a few years later came out out of that agreement. That's why that agreement is very important for many Chavistas. Uh, but we didn't see those, uh, the result of that agreement immediately. But meanwhile, Chavez was doing other stuff like the recovery of oil prices around two, two, the 2000s. And during the year 2000, I mean, the oil prices went down terribly. The income in Venezuela was terribly affected. And he launched this aggressive campaign visiting all the OPEC countries. And that's when they began satanizing also uh, Hugo Chavez because he visited uh, um, Iraq, the leader of Iraq, and many other countries satanized by, by, by the U.S. And and looking for uh, an agreement, a formula to recover the oil prices. And, and, that, and, and that campaign, Large Bank Venezuela uh, was effective and the prices of, um, by the end of the 2000 or the beginning of 2001, the oil prices were you know, gaining track again. And that's important for Venezuela, which is an oil country, of course. And, uh, but in 2001, uh, by the end of 2001, uh, the enabling laws were approved. And, uh, and I'm talking about Ley de Tierras, which is the land law and the fishery law, the uh, oil law, hydrocarbon law, and other laws were approved, but those are the most important ones. And during uh, that uh, the, uh, initiative, uh, executive initiative that was took by Hugo Chavez uh, with enabling laws, executive orders, basically, that uh, in order to move fast into the changes that he wants to do in Venezuela. Uh, and of course, that those laws implied a lot of things uh, against the interests of the oligarchy in Venezuela. And, and that uh, those laws were the triggers for the coup the, the d'etat against Hugo Chavez in 2002. Uh, in April 11, 2002, Hugo Chavez was, uh, I mean, there was a coup organized against Hugo Chavez. Uh, there, was, there were demonstrations against the, those laws that were launched since the beginning of January or February uh, 2002. And they ended up with this big demonstration against Hugo Chavez in 2002, in April uh, 2002, that, uh, you know, this demonstration decided to march towards Miraflores. 
the presidential palace. And, uh, and they ended up in a bloodshed that many in the media in Venezuela used to accuse President Chavez of being the, the responsible of massacring uh, demonstrator, which later was proven to be a big lie, to be, to, to be a manipulation of the reality. But that, but that was part of the misinformation campaign uh, needed in order to have the coup uh, done. So Chavez was taken into, <coughs> into custody. And one of the most amazing things that happened in Venezuela around Hugo Chavez is that they basically took him out of power and that and he was out of power for like about 48 hours. But the Chavismo and social media and the strategy of Chavista forces in Venezuela move the population, move the Chavista forces on the ground to push uh, the military in order to revert the coup d'etat. And that's what happened. I mean, basically, thousands of Venezuelans went to demonstrate against this coup d'etat when it was evident that it was a coup d'etat because there was at the beginning a lot of confusion even among um, many Chavistas. And then they pushed the military to uh, recover Hugo Chavez from La Orchila, a military base, uh, an island in the Caribbean, which is a military base uh, where they had a uh, captive Hugo Chavez and they managed to bring him back. And that happened in less than 48 hours. And, and it's important to highlight the coup uh, uh, against Hugo Chavez in 2002 because many Chavistas, like me, for example, uh, were heavily affected by, by what happened uh, in, in the coup d'etat against Hugo Chavez. I mean, I'm talking about my personal case uh, right now. I, I grew up uh, in a leftist family. We talk about politics all the time. I went to the Soviet Union to study for several years. And, but I didn't consider myself at that moment. I was just like 23 years old uh, at that moment. And I didn't consider myself, uh, I mean, I consider myself Chavista, but I didn't saw that I, that I need to, to do something else besides voting. And with the coup d'etat against Chavez uh, in 2002, we realized, many Chavistas realized that we needed to do more, that we needed to, to do more things in order to keep, to defend Chavismo and to make the Chavista revolution, the Bolivarian revolution happen via reality. So, so that was like a breaking moment for many, for millions of Venezuelans, if you ask me. Uh, and I include myself among them because, because uh, before uh, the coup d'etat against Chavez, I still believe in technocracy. I still saw that, you know, things might happen without too much politics being involved. And then I realized that that was a big lie, that everything is politics, that uh, every decision, even the ones taken with the, with the cover of uh, the appearance of uh, technical decisions, always, always have a political analysis in the background, a political hand moving the strings in the background. So it's important to highlight that because from that moment on, I realized that that a technocracy was a big lie. And, uh, and of course, uh, that the U.S. and Spain participate actively in that coup d'etat against, against Hugo Chavez. And the coup d'etat was reverted, but a few months later, they launched the oil lockdown, uh, they, some, the, the media, the right-wingers call it the PDVSA strike, which is a big lie because the strike was only uh, uh, organized and, and led by the upper managerial, you know, cast of PDVSA that were a bunch of right-wingers that called, called, called themselves technocrats, but at the end, and apolitical. And at the end of the day, they did one of the, the worst political uh, 
uh, manipulations and, 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 and acts that has been done in this country, which was basically stopping oil production in Venezuela just because they wanted Hugo Chavez out of office. And that happened between December 2002 and February uh, 2003. And the government managed to break that uh, coup d'etat because that was another coup d'etat attempt there that affected heavily Venezuela. And the, the finances of Venezuela were heavily affected uh, uh, for one or two years after the oil strike, the oil lockdown, sorry. Uh, so we jump right now to what I call the radicalization of the Bolivarian Revolution that happened between 2003 and 2012. The Misiones, which are mo many of them the result of uh, that uh, Cuba-Venezuela agreement, uh, uh, began to show results. I mean, we launched in 2003 uh, Misión Robinson, Misión Barrio Adentro. And I put the arrow of misinformation on there because many people say that Venezuela was doing that because we had a lot of money or because a lot of income from oil revenue and only because of that, we were able to, to do that. And the truth is that even today, in the middle of the worst economic aggression that I believe any Latin American country has lived uh, this, uh, besides Cuba, misiones are still alive. They are of course affected, but they are alive and, and moving on. Uh, with all the craziness of the damage in the economy that the blockade of the U.S. and Europe have caused in Venezuela. I'm talking about Mission Robinson, and Mission Robinson is that electricity program that was extremely effective and that helped us eradicate illiteracy in the majority of the population. Uh, and, and it did not end up there because that, that program was very comprehensive. I, uh, I mean, basically, there were uh, several misiones. We, we call Misión Robinson 1, Misión Robinson 2, Misión Rivas, Misión Sucre. They were like four or five different misiones connected to Misión Robinson, basically taking people from illiteracy uh, to, the, to help them finish elementary school. And then from there, help them finish high school. And from there, uh, they help them finish a technical, you know, associate degree or maybe high level degree. And, and that was an amazing program that, uh, uh, I mean, it's still there, but it was incredibly uh, effective and impactful during those years of uh, between 2003 and, 2000, um, and 2008. Uh, because, and you know, during those years was the process where most of the people, you know, was were taken out of illiteracy. And we also have Mission Barra Dentro, which was basically putting medi uh, medical doctors, I mean, and most of them Cuban doctors in the poorest county towns in the country uh, uh, in order to provide free health care for many people that didn't have in their life uh, any chance to go to a doctor because they didn't have money for that. So Mission, that was Mission Barrio Adentro. And like that, many other missions has been launched since then. And that's why I call it the radicalization of the Bolivarian Revolution because a lot of people realize what socialism was about. Uh, and, and that was, uh, you know, exemplified by those missions. In 2004, we had the recall referendum. The opposition has always been there trying to oust Hugo Chavez and, and then uh, President Maduro. They had this recall referendum uh, launch, taking the provisions uh, included in the new constitution uh, promoted by Hugo Chavez. Uh, uh, and they were defeated. Uh, and that was a, a, a good, a very dramatic moment in Venezuelan life. Uh, and... and and from there, we also jump to in the international arena to the rejection or the defeat of the free trade agreement of the Americas, the FTAA, which has a which was a, a trade initiative launched by the U.S. at that moment that they wanted to allow the U.S. to export everything to our region and, and and keeping us with a lot of restrictions to sell our stuff to the U.S. The traditional free trade uh, US style. 
and uh, and that created a new regional realignment. Uh, the beginning, President Maduro was basically alone in in political international scenarios in the region, uh, besides Fidel Castro, uh, that didn't participate in every in, in all the forums because the isolation the isolation that that Cuba has during those years. <clears throat> And uh, and uh, and with the defeat of the free trade agreement of the Americas that happened in Mar de Plata in Argentina, uh, well, and the main leaders were Hugo Chavez, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, Nestor Kirchner. Uh, this new political environment in the region was created that allowed the creation of Alba TCP of UNASUR, of CELAC, Petrocaribe, several um, integration, unity initiative that were created uh, mostly by the initiative of Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro, but also Lula participated in some of them. Uh, uh, Evo Morales then joined the club and, and Rafael Correa. So that created what many people call the pink tide in the region. Uh, because many progressive leaders took control of several governments in the region, so so that's basically the environment in the, in, the, in that particular moment between 2003 and 2012, and the, the, we had the constitutional reform in 2007 when Hugo Chavez wanted to deep uh, get deeper into socialist reforms in the country, uh, changing the constitution. I mean, that constitutional reform was. And defeated. That was one one of the the very uh, small numbers of electoral defeats that uh, Hugo Chavez had. Uh, and 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 another element in that constitutional reform was the was the possibility of being reelected for any elected official indefinitely. That created a lot of uh, misinformation. That's why I, I have the misinformation arrow there. Uh, uh, misinformation uh, smearing campaigns all over the world uh, and and the fact is that that no one talks when they are criticizing uh, that initiative of Hugo Chavez about Angela Merkel or Francois Mitterrand or Helmut Kohl or many many uh, U.S. Uh, senators and congressmen and congresswomen that has been in, in, in elected positions for decades and no one say anything about that. So so that's part of the double standards and the hip hypocrisy uh, of the North that is, a lot of things work for them in the North, but when uh, people in the South want to do something like that, uh, it, it won't work for us because we are Indians and we are, according to their races, uh, point of view, we are not able to to do things well, allegedly. Uh, so uh, we jump from that to the constitutional amendment in 2009, and in that constitutional amendment, President Chavez uh, basically asked uh, one only questions uh, in a referendum that was approved. Uh, in that case, uh, and he basically asked if uh, the Venezuelan people wanted to the, the constitution to be amended, amended to allow uh, indefinite reelections, and that was approved, and that's why President uh, uh, Chavez was finally um, re-elected a few years later. Then we come to Chavez, the Chavez trans the transition from Chavez to Maduro. And that was a terrible moment in Venezuela. I'm talking about December 2012 is the moment where President Hugo Chavez made his last public televised appearance. He came from Cuba. He stayed for a few days in Venezuela and, and he basically uh, asked Venezuelans to vote for Hugo Chavez, sorry, for Nicolás Maduro in the case uh, he, uh, he was not with us anymore. So at that moment, Hugo Chavez knew that something bad might happen to him. But a lot of people, uh, Chavista leadership in Venezuela, still believe that there was hope for Hugo Chavez to recover. So the idea of Hugo Chavez took many by surprise, even though uh, there were preparations and they were like, as I say, this, this call that Hugo Chavez did in December 2012, asking Venezuelans to vote for, for Nicolás Maduro. And I put the misinformation arrow there 
because after Chavez said in March 2013, uh, the presidential election happened a few weeks later. And a lot of people say that it was uh, uh, Hugo Chavez that decided, I'm, I'm talking about the, the misinformation, the, the mass media campaigns, uh, that Hugo Chavez uh, appointed uh, Maduro as president and Maduro is president because, because of that, like, 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 like a monarchy succession or something like that. And no one says that actually Maduro was elected. And it was a very complicated election because, uh, I mean, a lot of people, including me, believe that, that, that we were going to win easily that election, um, taking into consideration all the, all the sentiments that arose when Hugo Chavez died. The country was mourning. Many millions of Venezuelans were crying when Hugo Chavez died. And many of us assume that that, that was uh, uh, like a clue to believe that uh, allow us to believe that President Maduro was going to win easily. And the reality was different. I mean, Maduro won that election, but with a margin of 5% or something like that, which is not a terrible margin. Actually, uh, 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 Lula da Silva just won an election with 2% and no one criticized that. But when when Maduro won that election in 2013, uh, all the media criticized that he won only by 5%. Uh, anyway, I, I now talk about the first part of the presi President Maduro's government, and it begins with riots. I mean, Maduro has not had a second of peace uh, since the moment he was elected. Uh, uh, they were riots just a few hours after the results were announced of the elections in April uh, 2013 of, of right-wingers uh, not recognizing the results and calling for fraud without proving anything, just calling fraud out of the blue. Uh, they were regional elections a few months later in December 2013 and Chavismo won again. And and they and that defeat was more clear, more easy, and of course that make them realize that that it's not was not going to be easy uh, because they were thinking that they were going to get rid of Maduro very fast, that Maduro was not Chavez, and that Maduro has not the charisma of Chavez, and all the things that you read in mainstream media everywhere. But Maduro has been showing us that that he have a different approach, but that he is still rooted within the Chavismo, you know, movement, and 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 that's why that victory in December 2013 in, in regional election happened, and that move to the Guarimbas in in February 2014. Those Guarimbas were a, a basically violent protest. Uh, that are portrayed by mainstream media as peaceful protests, but in reality are very violent and that ended up with uh, some people being put in jail. And that, 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 that those guarimbas were called La Salida. And after those guarimbas, one of the main results of those guarimbas is that we put Leopoldo Lopez in jail because he was one of the main organizers of those guarimbas who were aiming at ousting President Maduro as always has been the case in, in the Venezuelan opposition situ, since 2006. Sorry, since, since the very beginning of Hugo Chavez taking power, actually. Uh, so after that, we enter into a process of deepening of the economic crisis. I'm talking about uh, between 2013 and, and 2017, uh, the, the exchange rate control uh, that at the beginning, uh, many, including me, believe that uh, was positive. Start uh, as it was, start you know showing cracks, and in the and the and the gap between the black market exchange rate and the official exchange rate widened a lot. <coughs> Sorry, and that created uh, the space for corruption, and that created a lot of distortions on the economy. And at that moment, if you ask me, uh, uh, they were not very good economic advisors. Uh, uh, and they make many of us, including me, believe that, that, that you know, keeping the exchange rate control was a good thing and keeping the, the price control was another good thing and that not paying attention to monetary um, discipline was also the right thing to do. But the reality show us a few uh, years later that that was not the case. Uh, and we jump into, in that, 
you know, particular environment, we had the legislative elections, the parliamentary elections of December 2015. And those elections were won by the right wingers. And that, that take us to the last, the second part of the of the of the government of Nicolás Maduro, was, uh, uh, basically with the opposition being in control of the National Assembly between 2015 and 2021, and exercising everything possible to oust Maduro. They called for vacancy uh, of the presidency, basically saying that he was not the president. They 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 try insanity. They try guarimbas in 2017 that was that were very lengthy and bloody. Uh, then we had the executive order in 2015, basically Obama setting the framework for all the set of sanctions and blockade that the U.S. and then Europe launched against Venezuela. Uh, 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 and that's, uh, of course, an imperialist alert because uh, since then, since the moment of the approval of the executive order, uh, a lot of things changed in Venezuela. Uh, and the attack of, of against Venezuela from abroad uh, got uh, stronger, and and that takes us to the second term of Maduro that wins the elections in in 2018, uh, because many of the opposition uh, parties decided not to run because they wanted to 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 subvert the elections. They received those orders from the U.S. And that's why, that's the only reason why you read in, in, in a lot of uh, mainstream media out there that, uh, that 2018 elections were illegitimate or were questioned or whatever. Yes, because they had that strategy already set up. Uh, and, but Maduro won those elections and, and, and the turnout, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of people that voted for him was very important uh, and but uh, they keep calling it uh, uh, trouble elections because that's part of the script that they already had uh, to try to oust Nicolás Maduro. And, and, and then he took office in, in 2018. There were assassinations attempts with drones against him. And then they launched the Guaido project in, in, in 1919 with this stupid idea of having an interim president that is not is not anywhere in the Venezuelan constitution is illegal is unconstitutional uh, but they keep pushing that narrative and a lot of people uh, out there uh, uh, believe uh, all these lies that mainstream media shows and uh, launch against against president maduro and promoting this crazy idea of the guaido project they launched uh, after that, uh, they radicalized the blockade against Venezuela, the sanctions against Venezuela, the diplomatic isolation with the Lima group, uh, you name it. They have tried everything possible, including uh, uh, the, the military mercenary incursions uh, like uh, Operación Gideon uh, that they launched in, I believe that it was in 2020. And uh, and then that ended up with the gringos coming back this year to Miraflores and sit with Maduro and Celia Flores pidiendo cacao, as I always say, basically uh, with the, the crisis, energy crisis uh, knocking on their doors and they realizing that they needed the Venezuelan oil. So that's where we are at this moment. Uh, uh, we Chavistas are... Just to finish the, the slideshow, I just want to say that Chavismo, after everything that I already told you, and I'm saying this because Sahili uh, asked, mentioned me something about that, and I want to end up my, my words just trying to explain what Chavismo is for me, and Chavismo is, for me, Chavismo is this uh, idea of this sentiment of uh, wanting to build a more just society, wanting to build a society based in solidarity, wanting to have a Latin American and Caribbean continent region united with the concept of Patria Grande, with the concept of Pachamama, uh, and, and, and of course wanting to move towards 
socialism uh, towards a uh, less uh, a society less uh, more democratic and less uh, and you know to get rid of the dictatorship of the oligarchy which is basically what what most of the people around the world are suffering right now and and that's what socialism for me and it, it also it also includes religion i'm i'm not a religious person so i i don't identify with that side of chavismo but i recognize that many chavistas uh identify themselves also like like religious like Christians in terms of Jesus Christ and his ideas of justice and, you know, equality uh, and those things that many people believe in. And, and, and I believe we are also part of the idea of Chavismo. So, guys, uh, I believe that I'm ready. I already talked too much and no one interrupted me. And that's very bad. Uh, at some points, I saw that I was talking to myself. I hope that that doesn't happen because sometimes my internet is faulty. I'm just joking. I just want to invite everyone, uh, Franz, Sahili, Sara, Uni, Roberto, uh, anyone from my team to, to join us. I'm just putting you in... Uh, in in gallery view in order for you to be viewed please turn on your cameras and your mics i want to see your faces to to know if i'm not alone here talking to myself <laughs> no no <laughs> actually people were very it was a great presentation thank you <laughs> compa <laughs> thank you feel free to ask the questions that you want guys Okay, so now actually we should first take some things from whatever people had asked. So I, I already put two questions here and there is another that's important. But anyway, so uh, first of all, it's I think this is important that you mentioned the enabling laws, especially the Lady Tierras, Lady Hidrocarburos and others. So what were these, what were these laws about? Like, because you said, and it's true that because of these laws being passed, there was the coup against Chavez. So, what were exactly these laws? How did they help people, and how did they take away privileges from the privileged so that there was the coup? Yes, that's a good question. Basically, I mean, the 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 land law uh, was a terrible uh, threat for the land oligarchy here in Venezuela. The people that control the lands, the, the, the latifundistas, as we call it, uh, and and of course, because I mean, because it allowed the government to take control of uh, tierras ociosas, as we call it. Uh, uh, I don't remember how how is that translated into English, but it's basically uh, either lands, I believe, lands that are not used, uh, but uh, that belongs to certain latifundista. So, 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 so that was a big threat for many latifundistas in Venezuela that, that, that didn't want to lose their privilege, their land. And, and the government, even with that law, was not talking about expropriation or something like that. With the, plopping was to, the government was talking about buying back those lands in order to give it to the, to the people that really need them, you know, to the campesinos. But um, but right wingers uh, are like that. I mean, they just want to keep their privilege. They don't want they, they, they don't want to make any concessions ever. It's like in the U.S. I mean, they, they are talking about firing tens of thousands of people in the U.S. or Canada or Europe um, because of the crisis. But they are making billions of dollars in in profits. And you wonder, how is that possible? I mean, how? How is possible that they are making more money than ever, and they are talking right now about, uh, you know, firing uh, ten thousands of people? So, so, so the same thing happened here, but of course in small scale. Uh, uh, in this particular area, we are talking about land, and 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 that was a threat for them, and they move all, every possible uh, uh, tecla. Uh, key uh, in order to in order to get rid of Chavez because of that uh, and the fishery land was another important land because uh, Chavez decided basically to get rid with those laws 
of the la, la, la pesca de arrastre is the name in Spanish. It's basically the 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 fisher uh, the the, in, the the fishing industry uh, based in having those big nets and taking uh, um, between two uh, ships and taking into those nets everything that they can get. And that was that with that law. Uh, pesca de arrastre en Venezuela was forbidden and and the right to fish was given back to the small fishermen because that pesca de arrastre, a pesca de arrastre killed most of the possibilities of the small of, of, from, of the small fishermen to really make a living because they were taking all the fish and that happened everywhere let me tell you, uh, and not people talk too much about the, 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 the that terrible, you know, practice. But uh, that what that uh, fishing law uh, means. One of the most important things that happened, and basically uh, that affected the interests of many capitalists that had uh, their business, their monopolies uh, operating, and they didn't want that to be changed. So, so that's basically. Uh, uh, you know the the background or the the impact of those laws uh, in changing the status quo in Venezuela in uh, in strengthening the dictatorship of the oligarchy in the country and of course they push everything they could uh, to get rid of Hugo Chavez and they did it for twenty four hours thankfully only. <laughs> well, if I can just only add a very small comment you know, that. Uh, most of those lands that the landlords, big landlords were holding, most of it was not even being used for agriculture. I was reading that more than 80% of that land was just owned by those latifundistas and not even used for cultivation. So it, the land law actually helped or should help in agriculture also. Uh, but anyway, uh, that is a different thing, I guess. I think uh, I would uh, ask But you I know that you want to go to the land reform. Right. Yes, actually, <laughs> actually, yes, because uh, actually do, I do. And I think that uh, this like uh, the land law, this law could actually connect to the land reform. And uh, let's talk about it. It's not just simply land reform. It's a agrarian reform because it should also transform agriculture itself. So anyway, so uh, let's I mean, it would, if you would just talk a bit about the land reform and then I think we can go. I believe that the land reform Hello. was an amazing policy that, that Hugo Chavez led. Uh, amazing. It was not aggressive uh, and, and because Hugo Chavez was not aggressive. I mean, at some point they put him, you know, in the corners and sometimes he had to be like tough. But the, the whole idea of the Chavista, the Bolivarian Revolution was not to do things like a la mala. He wanted, and we had resources to to buy bank land when we expropriate certain uh, transnationals or private companies. He paid those most of those companies at least. So, so I'm talking, I'm mentioning that to you because because uh, the land reform was also, uh, you know, moving in that sense, uh, and and a lot of land was given back to. Uh, campesinos in the country and 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 they were also in, in that land reform was not only uh did not ended up with giving back the land i mean a lot of loans were given to campesinos in order to to pay for machinery to pay for what is needed to and also uh technical advice i mean it was a very comprehensive approach uh that helped us I believe that we are seeing right now, uh, the, in the, uh, besides all the criticism, uh, but that, 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 that some mistake might happen in the land reform process, uh, we are seeing right now in the middle of this blockade and sanctions against Venezuela, we are seeing that we were capable of, of feeding ourselves disregarding being an economy based on oil. I mean, distorted by the whole oil boom that affected us in 1908. So 
So the, the, I believe that that's a, like a general overview. There were a lot of criticism. And of course, during these recent years that we don't have, having have enough resources because of blockade, economic crisis, sanctions, everything, uh, a lot of programs has been broken. And I cannot say that everything is, you know, color de rosas right now here. I mean, in the contrary, it's complicated. Uh, but 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 I believe that that, that 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 the results in general of the land reform that was launched by Hugo Chavez were very positive. They could be better, of course, but but we are seeing the results right now. We can jump to the to the other question if you want. Uh, if you Franz are okay with my answer. Something. No, 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 yeah. Franz was going to ask something. Franz, mm. why don't you turn on your... Hola, Jesus. Uh, just a quick question. I just wanted to know what your reaction was to the U.S. licensing Chevron with the GL41. Yes. And what it means for the near to near to near future in Venezuela. Yes, I, we wrote something about that a few days ago. Uh, and basically, in Orinoco Tribune, I mean, we published something a few days ago about uh, our take on, on that particular um, recent event and also uh, about the the agreement that was signed within the framework of the Mexico talks. And, and basically uh, what I believe happened is that uh, the gringos came back pidiendo cacao and and they need all the oil they can and the energy lobby laid by Chevron has a lot of strength uh, uh, over the White House, at least at, the, at this moment. And they basically use the excuse of the, the Mexico talks to allow its company Chevron to finally, because there has been rumoring that this was going to happen, uh, I believe that for a year or so. Uh, so so that it finally happened. They used the excuse of the Mexico talks and it will also help killing the Guaido project, if you ask me, because uh, the gringos don't know how to get rid of that crazy project launched by, 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 by Trump. But they don't want to do it like too, uh, I mean, too visible. So they are gonna do that by steps. So, 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 so the 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 whole scene is positive, as you asking. I mean, even though Chevron doesn't represent more than like than like than like ten percent of what Venezuela produced in the most recent best moment of oil production in the country. I mean, they only produced uh, like 200,000 barrels per day, which is something relatively important for some countries, but for us it's nothing. And it's like a, like like 10% of the, our best uh, output in recent years, because our best output ever was around 3.2 million barrels per day in the best moment in Venezuelan history. But that was like, 15 years ago or so. So so anyway, I mean that represents an additional income which we need. We had, we talk a lot about uh, economic recovery in Orinoco Tribune. We publish a lot of information about that, and that is a fact. But another fact is that economic recovery is not enough to move the country, move on uh, with the country, with the, the projects that the country needs. I mean, to move a country like Venezuela, like most countries, you need billions of dollars in income. If you want to improve uh, the, the, ele the electric projects that we need to recover our electric infrastructure, for example. If you need to recover the road infrastructure that is has been uh, 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 not uh, attended in recent years because of all the things that we know, uh, to recover the the energy, the telecommunication problems, the water problems that we have. We have, you name it, we have all the problems uh, possible. Uh, and I, I, I want to highlight that because sometimes when we talk too much about economic recovery, some people might have the wrong impression that 
everything here in Venezuela is perfect that they have to move back to Venezuela or Venezuela se arregló kind of, you know, slogan that the right wingers use a lot in social media. Uh, Venezuela got fixed. Venezuela se arregló is in Spanish. Uh, uh, and they use it a lot in social media to complain about many Venezuelans that has been returning in recent years to Venezuela in recent months. Uh, but it's not that's not our reality. I mean, we have a lot of problems and, and, and that income that will arrive to Venezuela from that license will help us a little bit. It will be an additional income that will come out of the oil exploitation, but also uh, because of the investments that Chevron needs to do inside Venezuela to hire more people, to pay for services, uh, to, you know, to restart you know, pumping up oil, which is not an easy process. I mean, th th those are processes. Some people believe that you just have to switch uh, una, una válvula and, and, and everything, and, and the oil will start pumping. And it's not like that. You need to drill. You need to, I mean, it's, it's a complex process that, that needs a lot of investment. So, so it's going to be positive in that sense. So, so many Chavistas here believe that that's something positive, that is an achievement. Uh, for Nicolás Maduro that has been saying that we are open to do that for months already. So it finally happened. So it's okay. If you ask me, there are some critics, of course, they say, oh, how are you going to sell oil to the gringos and blah, blah, blah. Come on, man. I mean, we are not, uh, we are not a, a, a kiosk. We are not like a, like a grocery store that, 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 I, that I hate that guy. And I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't do sell my stuff to him. I mean, it's a, it has a country that have its needs, that has its strategic, you know, decisions that that needs to be made taken, and 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 and, and we and Maduro was talking about that a few minutes ago. He was giving a press conference in Miraflores Palace a few minutes ago, and he was saying, "We are we are going to sell our oil. We always have been saying that we are going to sell our oil to whoever need the oil." We only uh, want uh, it to be at fair prices and that they don't believe that they will uh, tell us the price of the oil or give us directions on how to sell the oil or not that they are not going to follow our laws and our constitutional you know, uh, decisions. And I believe that that comment that, that, that he did about the laws and uh, the constitutional decisions have a lot of things to do with those a narrative that has been launched in, 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 in mainstream media after the approval of that license because uh, the wording of the of the of the of that license make many people believe that Chevron is gonna operate in Venezuela for free. I mean that they are gonna take uh, the oil and that they are not gonna pay royalties or because the 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 the, the, the license uh, says so uh, uh, and and the truth is that they the, I mean the Venezuelan law do not allow that to happen. I mean, if Chevron will operate in Venezuela, they will have to pay taxes, royalties, and whatever they have to pay. But of course, they twist language. Uh, and, and basically, they are playing with words in order to make it believe that Chevron won't pay. But in reality, what I mean, the one that is going to pay those royalties in Venezuela are the joint ventures. I mean, Petro Boscana, Petro Piar, that are the joint ventures of Chevron with PDVSA. I mean, uh, foreign companies do not operate in Venezuela alone. They operate uh -huh. with joint ventures with Venezuela where uh, those foreign companies have the minority in the state. And uh -huh. PDVSA has the majority. How's, how's the, 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 that's, the, that's the working model that Hugo Chavez uh, imposed in, in the hydrocarbon law that was also part of those enabling laws in 2001. So, I mean, that, that's part of the, and that of course, a lot of corporations didn't like those changes in the hydrocarbon law, in la, in la ley de hidrocarburos. So that takes us back to the enabling laws that we were talking about before. All right, thanks. Yeah, that, that's actually very, I mean, that's a big answer on a lot of things, not just Chevron, but also, all these enabling laws and stuff. 
And we can just say that Venezuela needs the income. And especially since we're talking about that everything is not fine and Venezuela is not fixed and all, we should uh, remember that Venezuela lost 99% of its foreign income and has not been able to recover it because of the sanctions. So that's... That, that's it like even if venezuela has recovered a bit it's it's like a drop in the ocean so i believe yeah, that, i believe that's like something important i believe that steve said uh, in, yes, a, in steve an said, event steve that we organized it. a few months ago that mm-hmm. and i believe that is important to make it graphic for some people i mean the income in venezuela felt from 2013 i believe or 2014 or to 2021 uh, by 75% so just to give you an idea, I mean, the, I'm talking about the GDP, the gross domestic product. I mean, the, the way uh, the IMF measures how an economy grows or decreases. Uh, that means that if we produce 100, whatever, trillions of dollars, millions of dollars or whatever, in 2013, we in 2021 only uh, produce uh, 25. So if the GDP growth in 2021 was 10%, that means that is 10%, not, not out of those 100, but out of the 25. So I'm talking that that the 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 increase the economic recovery that we experienced last year means that we have right now 27.5 of that is nothing if you compare it with the 100 that we produce in 2013 do you do you see what i'm trying to to show you i mean we are still very deep down there uh disregarding the fact that we are uh, uh, experience an economic recovery. I believe that it's important to highlight that because some people criticize that the government is is launching these initiatives to bring uh, foreign investments and and some people criticize that we signed these uh, uh, agreements to uh, to with uh, I mean the the the, 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 the that we are happy because this general license was approved by OFAC a few days ago, and 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 that's part of the answer. I mean, it's like we need resources uh, and we don't have uh, uh, the levels of resources that we had uh, 10 years ago. So I believe that is important to remember those numbers that, that, that Steve raised a few months ago in an event that we had. Mm, right. So, uh, and then there is uh, our friend Yuri, of course, he's always asking a lot of questions. Okay. So Yuri asked about uh, two two different things. I think that those can be punched together. One is that what, since you have already talked of uh, literacy and other missions, housing missions, literacy missions, health missions, etc. He is also asking about the missions for women's rights and indigenous peoples. That is one question. And the second one is that what are Venezuela's efforts in dealing with the climate crisis? This is actually a very important question because Venezuela is a country that is mostly dependent on selling oil. And well, so the question is what are, how to reconcile these supposed contradictions? I might have to say something about it, but anyway, I'd let you speak about that, both the missions for women and for indigenous people, and also for and, uh, what Venezuela is doing with the climate crisis, yeah. That's fine. Uh, I mean, uh, the indigenous, approach of Chavismo is amazing. If you ask me, I mean, actually, the, 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 the new constitution approved by Hugo Chavez uh, help us. Uh, I mean, help the indigenous people to regain a lot of rights that they didn't have before. Uh, I mean, the government, if the government wants to do anything, a project in, a, in lands that belongs to indigenous people, they need to get the approval of the indigenous people. It's not like in the U.S. or Canada that the government do whatever they want and the, the indigenous people start screaming and protesting and they repress them and they silence them and they buy them. 
is different. I mean, actually, uh, a few months after the approval of the Constitution, a big project of uh, electric project uh, uh, between Brazil and, and Venezuela happened, and that affected uh, indigenous areas, and the project was stopped like for for several, because they needed to, to install these big uh, torres, towers, electric towers to put like the, the wires. Uh, basically, Venezuela was interconnecting itself uh, with the north of uh, Brazil, and because they are always in with problems with electricity there, and we had uh, our hydroelectrical plants in the south of the country, uh, in Bolivar State that borders Brazil. So basically, they were trying to 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 build these lines, electric lines between the two countries, and and the in the Pen Pemon uh, and other indigenous. Um, uh, people from that part of Venezuela, uh, they stopped the project uh, and uh, a few months or, or, or maybe one or two years later, they finally find the way that was beneficial for the indigenous people and for the government. Uh, we recognize indigenous languages, uh, which many people call dialects, and to minimize the, you know, the, 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 the real relevance of, 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 yes, yes, that's part of the, the problem in the, in the communication, I mean, uh, a lot of people talk about uh, the language of the indigenous people like dialects, uh, the same thing happened with religion. I mean, the, the, the religion that is practiced by 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 Afro-Caribbeans in, 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 in I, I mean, people in the Caribbean, they call it like uh, sects or whatever, but, but, but you know, it's, it's part of the, of the same Eurocentric racist approach towards us. And, and 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 we open schools for for kids in those areas that that teach them in their own languages. We have uh, uh, electoral procedures especially designed for uh, respecting the indigenous traditions. It's complex, uh, but uh, but but it happens. Uh, and when I talk about respecting the indigenous tradition, I'm talking about uh, about that the assemblies that they organize and the way that they give more more importance to the elder uh, within some tribes and and and, and those things are, are are part of right now of uh, our the ways uh, of Venezuela's approach towards indigenous people that is way different than what happened before. What happened before is the way that many countries in Latin America still have, which is basically we are the cri criollos in the capital and we tell you what to do. And if you don't like it, you will be repressed. That's what basically happened, not only in Latin America, that happened even in the US, in Canada, all, all over. So, so, so that's what I can say right now, as far as with the things that come to my mind about the indigenous scene, uh, rights to women. Uh, if you ask me, I believe that we still are very uh, behind of what I wish we have. I believe that that's an uh, that's a karma that we have as Latinos, machistas, uh, which is terrible, but it's there. It, and that's a reality. It exists there. Uh, and uh, and but we have achieved many things. I mean, uh, the, the, I mean, the, Hugo Chavez. I be, I really believe that he was a real feminist guy. I mean, he he truly believed in the importance of having more women in in power positions, and and he had a lot of uh, uh, women as ministers. He created the, the ministry for women, and that ministry still exists in Venezuela. I mean, there were a lot of uh, things that has been changing since Hugo Chavez took power. But one of the things that I believe that is most important is the one connected to the uh, the rights to to their body. I mean, uh, abortion, for example. Uh, we have very regressive and conservative uh, laws in Venezuela in relation to abortion. To abortion, sorry. And uh, and uh, what else? Uh, we still have problems of uh, uh, domestic violence, violence against women, like in many Latin American countries and other countries around the world. 
uh, and, uh, and the government has been trying to reduce that, but I believe that we can do more. Uh, what was the other part of the question? Environmental issues. Yeah, uh, so, 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 I mean, whenever someone could ask me about that, I immediately, what comes to my mind is Juan Vicente Gomez, as I mentioned you in the slideshow. I mean, was Juan Vicente Gomez making deals with those guys from the U.S. corporations exploiting oil in Venezuela. And, and, and I mean, I'm not trying to blame, put the blame on the U.S. corporations, but they changed our economic landscape. That's a reality. It was not us. We, we were not asked to, to I mean, we, we did not need uh, that oil. That, that oil was needed in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, and and of course we ended up having the economic model that, that, that we currently have that is very dependent on, on oil uh, and of course oil uh, itself is uh, an ecologic uh, you know like like an ecological uh, weapon it's like a, an ecological bomb but you cannot blame us for that i mean I, I, what i'm trying to tell you is that that, that a lot of people in the north uh, do not make the analysis in the proper perspective that I'm trying to show you right now. Uh, that we can do better. I mean, uh, for example, uh, PDVSA disregarding all the crises in recent years have uh, an incredible record in, uh, you know, environmental um, impact. I mean, we, we, PDVSA has a very good record in avoiding uh, oil spills, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, but we have a very low rate uh, in that particular area. Another thing important uh, that many people do not know is that the electricity in Venezuela is like 70 or 75 percent uh, relies on not in oil, but on hydroelectrical plants. Uh, and, and, and that says a lot about, you know, the, 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 our approach towards of course, hydroelectrical plants are also criticized by all so other people, environmentalists. But anyway, I mean, nothing is perfect. There's a lot of things that can be, you know, questioned and criticized if you want to criticize everything. But I'm just trying to show you a few things that we have been doing in order to, in order to, to make uh, the the impact of our economic, main economic activity less damaging to the environment. But also I already mentioned what the things that we have been doing, trying to diversify. We, when I talk about the land reform and I mentioned you all the efforts that we were doing in order to um, promote uh, uh, a fair, more justice uh, economic uh, land development, uh, agricultural development in the country. And we are, so, as I told you, I mean, we are seeing the results of that. And there's a big economic agricultural uh, activity right now in Venezuela. And because of that activity is that we are eating mainly because of the blockade, because of the sanctions. And it's amazing how uh, the agricultural mm -hmm. sector responded to the sanctions because even in the worst moments of the of the of the sanctions, I'm talking about 2019, 2020. Uh, I mean, we see more. You uh, in Caracas, you see uh, we have like a street markets that that I mean with uh, with trucks that comes mostly from the west of Venezuela, from the Andes, where we have most uh, of the agricultural lands. You see trucks that brought all the products that they produce and they, they and they put their tents in the streets and during those years uh you see more of those trucks coming to caracas than ever so uh that when, when i saw that it, during those years i realized that that the gringos were not going to be able to to defeat us that easy so I, I hope that I answered your question, Yuri. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. I would just add a very little bit of things regarding the climate crisis and all the things. Because it's mentioned a lot of times, but we should also look at 
the per capita uh, emissions and the total emissions of a country also. Venezuela That's is true. responsible for only 0.4% of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, last year. So that's like 0.4%. Let's compare it with uh, the US, with Canada. Like Canada has a small population. Compare it that it has the highest per capita greenhouse gas emission in the world. So like Venezuela how is, much it is nothing. Do you remember? <laughs> Do you remember how much it is in Canada? I, I don't know. Uh, oh, well, uh, I think Canadians here would remember better. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's actually the per capita is the highest. Like they, when they were actually talking about China being a very polluting country, etc. It was the Chinese who were putting all this thing on social media that Canada is the, like the highest per capita polluting country in the world. And it's just about greenhouse gases. There are many other kinds of pollution that Venezuela does not do, but Western countries do. So just pointing fingers at oil producing countries and claiming that they are responsible for anything about yes, climate is not hypocrisy. true. Really. It's, it's not really true. Yes. So yeah, that's uh, one thing I wanted to say. And I think I should give space to other people to speak. Let's speak, yeah. guys. Um, can I be heard? Yes. I uh, just wanted to shout you out, um, Jesus. This was a great talk, super Absolutely. informative, um, very combative to the imperialist narratives, which is exactly what we got to do. Um, I got a homie in the chat, uh, Milo, a dear friend. Um, I think you touched on the uh, the garimbas in mm -hmm. um Venezuela, and you made a comparison to the um, garimbas in of like Nicaragua. If you can generally just explain what the garimbas were and how they operated in Venezuela. Yes, that's important. And, and, and one sometimes jump into saying guarimbas and not and not explaining why it is. And I believe that the question is important because, as I said, I mean the guarimbas are the violent protests that are portrayed by mainstream media as peaceful protests. I believe that that's the most important part of them. Uh, but it's worse than that, actually. And that's why the question is good, uh, because uh, during the Guarimbas, right-wingers, they, at least in the case of Venezuela, they go around their neighborhood, the places where they live, and they build barricades and they burn tires and burn whatever they put in order to close the transit in their neighborhoods, but also in some important highways that are nearby in avenues and roads. And, and that itself is, a, is an illegal action. You, ha you, you can have the right to protest everywhere, but the, your right to protest cannot go above to the right of transit. You know, uh, uh, I know that that might sound uh, contradictory because sometimes I, I applauded uh, my compass in the US that close on roads, <laughs> but but that's a reality. I mean, you cannot deny that. I mean, it's, it's against the law. You you take it or not. I mean, you are assuming or not. In the case of our right wingers, they they portray themselves like they are uh, uh, angels that you know that fell, fell from heaven and that they are peacefully uh, closing roads and, and burning people and killing people. Uh, and 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 the reality is that if you the problem the problem is not that you break the law or not. The problem is how you portray yourself after you do that. If you portray yourself like, okay, I, I did that and I know that I broke the law, but I am I, I, I want to launch a rebellion. You know, you, you are do taking the responsible approach. In the case of our people in Venezuela, they, what, what they always say is that I didn't do anything. I just was, I was just protesting and the government is repressing me. I'm an angel. Uh, and that's part of the hypocrisy that they have. You know, if, if they want to, if you want to, promote a coup d'etat, do it. I mean, all the people have the right to re reveal themselves if, you know, the conditions, are, are, they face certain conditions. But you are going to break the law and you're going to have to face uh, the consequence of that. Uh, and you have to be responsible of not, uh, enough to recognize 
that you are breaking the law. I'm t I believe that I'm jumping <laughs> to another <laughs> very different subject. But anyway, I, I going back to the Guarimbas, uh, they basically did that. And, and they keep uh, us, the ones that were not Chavista, I mean, that were not right wingers, like kidnap in our own neighborhoods. A lot of people cannot move, cannot go to work because they close all the roads. Uh, they 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 attack. They put the, there's a there's a terrible video of some policemen you know, during the Cuarimbas in 2017 that were passing through a, a square in Caracas in Altamira in the east, where the right wingers live, and they basically put a bomb there, and those policemen jumped to the air. You don't see that that video uh, very often, that but that was part of the Guarimbas. I mean, there was a lot of violence against the police, against the, the, the National Guard that is also responsible for, you know, security uh, issues here in Venezuela. So, so they exercise violence, but they portray themselves like they are just like uh, protesting with a banner or something like that. So I don't know if that answered your question. I I believe that something similar happened in Nicaragua. Right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um when I was in Nicaragua, they were talking about it a lot. It was it was exactly what you described. Like people would set up um little barricades either with bricks and stuff like that and stop you and ask you if you were um left wing. They're like, if you are you Cuban, are you Venezuelan? You say, yeah, you're gonna be in trouble. And that was a kind of way of um it's just terrorism. It's just they, they uh, kill people. They kill people. In the case of Venezuela, they keep people neighborhoods that were trying to move the barricades. And many Venezuelans died that way, being killed by the right wingers, by the guarimberos, as we call them. So 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 it's violence. It's, and, and 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 when you listen to the media, you you just read that they are like peaceful demonstrations, but it's a big lie. In most of the cases, I, I'm not saying that some of those, you know, protests uh, were non-violent, but, but in our case, it's like 95% were violent. They were set up by violent people. Of course, they will be violent and they were paid to be violent. So yes, let's not yes, about that's it. another like part the that there's they were pay people also um, that were, exercise violence. Just like, you know, in, it was similar in Nicaragua. They were like when people tried to remove the barricades, they were killed. Like a lot of people said that. So anyway, that's uh, well. I think uh, we should be moving forward. And there is my friend Pedro asking a question about the Communist Party of Venezuela. <laughs> he said, "Can okay. you discuss?" Can you discuss the alliances that the PCV has made recently with the Venezuelan opposition? Who made the question? That I... Pedro is a friend. <laughs> actually, he is ah, actually a friend of yours. Oh, well known. Okay. Okay. Don't because just I, a friend I know of mine. another I mean, Pedro was... from the Communist Party. Pedro, I would say that uh, I say, wow, Pedro. No, no, is... this, this, <laughs> this, is Puerto, this. this is Puerto Rican. <laughs> Pedro is, is one of the leaders of the Communist Party here in Venezuela. And the other day I talked to him, I, I don't talk very often to him, but the other day, I, like a couple of months ago, I, I actually talked to him and told him that I was not, as we have transpired over the recent years, uh, that, we, that we not agree with the, the approach that they had uh, in recent years after they break with the government. I mean, you can break with the government if you want. I mean, the problem is that as the, I mean, as the Communist Party of Venezuela did a few, I believe that two years ago or so. Uh, so, so the problem is that you, from breaking with the government, jump to the right wingers' arms. That that's a bad part. I mean, and 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 that uh, I I believe that some people in the Communist Party might might hate me for saying this, but uh, that's my impression of what they has been doing. They uh, they. When the when we had the last elections here in Venezuela last year, they had a meeting with the European Union, uh, saying uh, all the but I mean, like like any other right wing party had meetings with with uh, with the European Union. They had their meetings and they were saying all the atrocities uh, 
that the Venezuelan government was doing in, in, in the elections, which is a big lie. I mean, I'm not saying that elections are perfect in Venezuela. I believe that elections are not perfect anywhere. But saying that the, the government of Venezuela is responsible for irregularities that avoided uh, our elections is a big lie. And they were saying something like that in that meeting with the European Union. They are actually, I hear a few weeks ago, a person from Patria para Todos. Patria para Todos is one of those parties that joined the Alianza Revolucionaria, Alianza Popular Re Revolucionaria, APR, which is, was some sort of coalition that the, right, the, that the Communist Party organized with some political parties, friend of them, uh, to try to present candidates for the last elections. Not only the regional ones, the, the parliamentary ones that we had last year, but also the regional ones that we have the year before, I believe. So, uh, so that guy in this radio interview was talking about PPT participating in the opposition primaries. And P PPT is uh, the leader of PPT, that is Uzcategui, Rafael Uzcategui, is a very close friend of, of the leader of the PCV. I mean, they are the same people. I mean, of the leadership of the PCB of the Communist Party of Venezuela. So I, I believe that they are like pointing at the right direction. I mean, that they are aiming their attacks at the, at the wrong direction and they doing that are joining the forces of other leftist organizations that ended up, ended up in nothing like Marea Socialista, like La like Bandera Roja, Movimiento al Socialismo, other leftists or extreme left parties that joined the opposition a few years ago and right now are nothing. Uh, and I, it's a shame because I always been sympathetic to the Communist Party uh, and I always feel more, felt more uh, uh, connected to the, to the Marxist-Leninist approach than to the approach of the PSUV. If you ask me, if you want me to be very honest about that, I, I believe that the, the, the PCB has a better cadre formation. The PSUB lacks a lot of that. Uh, but, but what they are doing is not right. And I cannot say that, that, that what they are doing is right. So I don't know if that answered the questions, but, but it's basically that they are, they are accusing Maduro of, of being repressive. They are taking all the, the the talking points of Washington and recycling it, trying to make them sound a little bit anti-imperialist, uh, but they keep pushing them. Of, of Maduro being anti-democratic, uh, a human rights, strong man, uh, repressor, uh, uh, you name it. I mean, uh, of having elections, rigged elections, uh, of uh, implementing neoliberal packages and abandoning the legacy of Hugo Chavez and all this stuff. And the reality is that Maduro has been doing, I'm not saying that I feel that Maduro is the, you know, the toughest Marxist Leninist person that I've seen. I don't think that Maduro is actually a Marxist Leninist, if you ask me. But I believe that he is doing way better than the Communist Party at least in these recent years of struggle that we have been facing, Maduro has been doing an amazing job. And as I mentioned in the presentation, since the first day he took office, he has been attacked by the right wingers and now by the, by the, by the, by the gringos and the Europeans. So it's not an easy task. And I admire the way that he has been also being able to recover the economy in recent months. So, so attacking Maduro uh, from the, with a far left, extreme left positions, just because you hate it, because he didn't give you what you wanted at some moment, because ECB has been always in alliance with the government since President Chavez was in office. Uh, but they break with the government like two or three years ago. So I don't know exactly why. 
uh, but I believe that they felt that they were not taken into consideration enough or or whatever. I don't know. I, I really don't know. But 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 you can break with the government if you are in disagree with the government. But from there again to shake hands with the right wingers, that's not the right you know way to do things. If you ask me. Ah. <clears throat> The reason that the PCV gave for breaking with the government was, of course, the anti-blockade law, and they did it like two years ago in 2020, when the anti-blockade law was approved. So, yeah, they were saying that the anti-blockade law was basically selling off uh, Venezuelan resources to the foreigners, etc. Although, of course, the constitution does not allow it and all that. Mm -hmm. But they were just saying that that through the anti-blockade law, because there is this thing about keeping the identities of the investors and the companies secret that this would this is actually a way a tool of selling of resources without letting people know it was a very bad like it is a, a, a very bad faith argument because lots of countries most of the i mean a third more than a third of the world's population is under sanctions now so a lot of countries have similar laws and uh, nobody and also and they that. talk a lot also sorry to interrupt you but they talk mm -hmm. a lot about Maduro pulverizing ah. the wages of the <laughs> Venezuelan, the poor Venezuelan people. It was, not, it was not Maduro. I mean, it was the U.S. aggression, the European aggression, the one that has been pulverizing. Uh, I mean, uh, since Chavez took office and then when Maduro was in power, we had very good wages, uh, uh, salaries in Venezuela. And, and, and all that ended up in 2017 or 2018, when they began with the whole aggression against PDVSA, and then in 2019, when they completely, you know, launched their attacks with sanctions and blockade against Venezuela. And of course, that created hyperinflation, that created a crazy devaluation of the Bolivar, and the salaries went down the drain. And that's a reality, but you cannot blame Maduro of that. I mean, um, we, the government has been trying to make the economy do better. I mean, uh, it's, it's not better, of course, right now, but we are way better than two years ago. And the whole idea of the government is trying to make it better in the years to come. And I hope that that happened because the situation here is tough. Prices are going up. Even though we are basically a dollarized economy currently, uh, uh, the, the, the inflation affects you a lot. Yeah, because it's a dollarized economy, there is there could be more inflation also. I, I'm not saying that it is because of the reason, but it could be. But let's not talk economy. I'm just uh, thinking because you have also mentioned Rafael Caldera. PCV was in government with him also. And then the there mass. was... Uh, uh -huh. And the PPT, yeah. yes. And of course, since you mentioned movement or socialism, I should mention that this mass is different from the Bolivian one. It's a different. Yes, party. absolutely. The it's Venezuelan not the same one thing. is at the Venezuelan one is a different party, and both PCV and MAS were in government with Caldera, but they had to leave because of because he was so neoliberal. So I, I guess I hope PCV wakes up this time also. And the Communist like Party, it, I believe, that was part of Calderas also. Yes, if you ask me, right now. And, and it's terrible because the guy, Caldera, privatized everything. As I mentioned, go ahead, Sahih. Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> that is why, in fact, that is why PCV broke from that government. So they are bro broke it from that government for the right reason. But this time they're doing it for the wrong reason. So that's, that's very bad. Like they're not really progressing if you ask me anyway yes. so uh, that i think that was all the people had asked i think there might be even more but we, if we uh, continue we'll be being here we'll remain here forever forever so, yes and we're reaching yeah. the two hours already we've so, crossed the two hours i think <laughs> yes <laughs> so anyway so uh, if yeah. there's no other question we can do the closing uh, but if yes, you have I something else should, there I think we should do a closing up. I mean, we could go on discussing things forever, but I think we of should course. be doing a closing and we could uh, we could just have more episodes in future. Of course, we'll have. We should not be finishing everything here. Yes, yes. I was thinking, taking into consideration something that we discussed a few days ago in our last meeting. I'm talking about our last Ordinoco Tribune meeting, that maybe we should do something like 
I was thinking in a name that Venezuela True Squad with these short videos that Robert, I believe, was the one that proposed. It uh, was Mateo. Talking, ah, oh, Mateo, talking about, about, uh, about Venezuela, but with short videos, you know, talking about, uh, you know, people are dying in the street because there's no food in Venezuela and making a short video showing people that people are not dying in the streets. I mean, even in the worst moment of, you know, the aggression against Venezuela, that didn't happen, you know, uh, and things like that, you know, like like writing down uh, several, uh, like 10 or 15 of those talking points that you read everywhere all the time in mainstream media and making those short videos that that might do, that might that might be good i'm just sharing that idea with you taking into consideration the recommendations that you raised in the last meeting sorry sahi for stopping you again no no i, I am not say, I, i i want to be stopped so i think we should be closing this up if we, uh, we if we do not want to spend here all day So I, I would ask like Sarah to just talk about, well, about whatever he should say, new projects, donations, and whatever else you wished. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, sounds great. Thanks. So um, first of all, as we wrap up the fourth anniversary event, um, I want to say thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the presentation and the conversation on Chavismo. Um, thank you to Jesus again for a fantastic presentation. Um, yeah, and thank you to everyone for tuning in, for your questions, and for your support of Orinoco Tribune. Um, as we said earlier, we're 100% reader funded, so we don't receive any funding from governments, businesses, or NGOs. And currently, right now, we're also expanding. We're doing a lot more kind of multimedia content along with our regular website content. We're doing live streams like this. We're doing video interviews here on our YouTube channel. Um, so, and we depend entirely on donations to do this. Um, as Sahili said earlier, we currently have a pledge drive to increase our monthly donations. So if you want to donate, you can make monthly donations through the Alliance for Global Justice or through our Patreon. Um, or you can also do one-time donations through PayPal, or we have an Amazon wedding registry as well. If you want to directly contribute equipment that would make our work a lot easier and more efficient. Um, all and any donations are very welcome and extremely value to, valuable to us. Um, thank you to everyone who's already donated. Um, and so I believe that's all, unless anyone would like to add anything else. That's it, Sarah. I'd like to <laughs> shout out Shahili, who's who's up at like I don't know what three in the morning. What time? What time yes, is it over there? Must be yes, in India. Yes, Shahili. So yeah. All the props. That's true. For I'm losing you. Facilitating the whole thing. It was a wonderful presentation, and <laughs> thank you, friends. Thank you. Uh, if anyone want to add something. You are free to do it. Thank you all for being here and making this happen. Un abrazo, compas. Bye-bye. I'm going to stop.